there's so much that we can do and we can extend the life of especially these old senior dogs by so much. I mean, I've seen dogs that I, I thought this dog is going to be put to sleep and a week or two later, we're starting to see improvements and six months later, they're doing one hour walks, you know, so there's a yeah. lot that we can do. In human medicine, physiotherapy has gone from being a really niche option to the mainstay of treatment for many different injuries that we suffer from. And to be honest, the chances are is that you may have had physiotherapy pretty recently and may even have consulted your physiotherapist rather than your doctor. So why are we not doing the same thing for our pets? Well, in this episode, I talk to the physiotherapy expert, Dr. Meg Kelly, about physiotherapy, hydrotherapy and rehabilitation services and the magnitude of impact that these really can have to our pet dogs and cats. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps keep your furry family as healthy as possible so they can live the full and happy life they deserve. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the podcast for every pet owner who really wants their dog or cat to be as healthy as possible. And I've got an absolute corker for you today. There are so many different complementary and alternative treatments out there for our pet cats and dogs that are very much on the fringe of veterinary medicine and pet healthcare as a whole. And physiotherapy probably is still in that fringe group, but it definitely deserves to have more recognition for the benefits that it can provide to a whole range of different dogs and cats. So the classic use of physiotherapy might be after a cruciate surgery, for example, but your pet doesn't have to have undergone surgery to benefit from the effects of physiotherapy, which we'll discuss in a lot more detail today. But just before I jump into today's episode, episode. I'd like to welcome you if you're new to the show. Really happy to have you along and I hope you get a great deal of benefit from today's conversation. And if you want to keep in touch with all of my future episodes, make sure that you hit that subscribe button in whatever podcasting app you're listening to. So I'm going to be bringing you lots more interviews with experts. I'm going to bring you deep dives into specific medical problems and preventive health issues for your pet. And I can also answer your question too, which you can submit over at callthevet.org. But that's it from me with the intro. For now, let me introduce you to the fantastic Dr. Meg Kelly. Dr. Meg Kelly, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. This is such a hugely important area that's often neglected in veterinary practice and veterinary surgeons often don't think about this as a main core service that can be offered. So I'm really pleased that you're here to join us and tell us all about physio, rehabilitation, hydrotherapy. But I wonder just to start with, did you want to let us know how you entered the world of veterinary rehab? Yeah, Alex, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited um, to chat about obviously a topic that I'm very passionate about. So my background is I'm actually, I was actually a veterinary nurse before I was a vet. So I did veterinary nurse first and then became a vet. And I've always had this passion for physiotherapy. And I think before I wanted to be a vet or vet nurse, I'd actually wanted to be a horse physiotherapist. Okay, wow. and, and there wasn't any courses to do it. So I, I couldn't study it. And I found a course actually in the UK and that I had to be a vet nurse to do that course. And that's why I did the veterinary nursing. <laughs> and then doing veterinary nursing, you know, I then thought, oh, maybe I should actually just become a vet. Um, And it's so funny that I actually just went straight back to actually what I really wanted to do and sort of focus on veterinary rehabilitation or veterinary physiotherapy. Um, So after qualifying as a vet, um, I went and did a course in in the States at the University of Tennessee. Um, And it's basically like a certificate that vets, vet techs and physios can do. Um, And got myself into the field of veterinary rehabilitation or veterinary physio. And um, yeah, I haven't looked back. I mean, for me, it was... A big change going from sort of normal private practice, going into just doing veterinary rehabilitation, but it was wonderful for me. I really just love helping animals to improve their mobility, improve their quality of life. Um, and so, yeah, it's great work that we do. Yeah, fantastic. So you've seen kind of the pet healthcare from every every single professional aspect, which is yeah amazing. That's a great experience that not many of us will have had. So thinking about kind of rehabilitation, and I guess a lot of us will just think physiotherapy, and that's the only modality. And maybe we'll jump into those other options later on. But what kind of conditions should pet owners, dog and, and cat owners, be thinking about? using physiotherapy or or rehabilitation services? Because 
often it's maybe recovery from a big surgery but there's so much more that you guys can offer a whole range of different patients so kind of which maybe conditions are are the key ones that you see and consider physiotherapy and other rehabilitation therapies playing a major role yeah i mean it's pretty similar if you think about it to humans so i mean for people we go to physiotherapy if we've got a sore back maybe if we're a little bit arthritic somewhere they help us Um, So these are the kind of cases that we are seeing. We're seeing maybe senior dogs um, and cats or horses if you're treating horses, but older older patients that maybe have osteoarthritis, dogs that have just had an injury. So they might not have necessarily had a surgery. Maybe they've just had a slip or a fall. We see a lot of agility dogs and performance animals, so animals that are competing, that are trying to maybe make sure that they are strong enough to be able to do the competitions or if they get an injury, Uh, sometimes some paralyzed dogs. And some of these cases, you know, they might not necessarily have surgery. So sometimes you might get a a patient that um, the the vet has said, oh, we recommend surgery and the owner has opted not to do surgery for whatever reason. And so these cases we'll we'll treat. And then we're obviously also doing those post-operative paralyzed cases that are, that are also had already had surgery. And then also we often treat dogs maybe that are overweight and cats. I've had lots of cats yep. that are overweight, putting them in the underwater treadmill. <laughs> I'm trying to get them to exercise. You know, when yep. dogs are overweight like that, you know, often it puts a load on their joints and they struggle to get up. And it's really hard um, for owners to be able to motivate them to get them moving. So yep. we use their, them putting them in water, doing hydrotherapy to get them to exercise and Usually we find once they lose a little bit of weight, then they can start to to mobilize um, a little bit better. But a lot of them will just be conservative treatments of certain conditions. Um, so it's not always after surgery that we, we're seeing these patients. So that's a huge subset of kind of the, the, the veterinary caseload, isn't it? Like older pets with arthritis. Well, arthritis is yeah. pro- massively under-recognized in general and... Many of those pets are unfortunately just given painkillers and nothing else, but yeah, yeah, rehabilitation. So that is does that that's kind of building up muscles, keeping muscle mass, maintaining range of motion, that kind of thing. Is that what the aim of physiotherapy is for for those arthritic patients? Yeah. So those older arthritic patients, we've got two main goals that we want um, to achieve with them. So the one is to control their pain. And, and we like to do this in ways where we're not using anti-inflammatories and painkillers. Often they will come and they're already on uh, medications. And we try as much as we can to use alternative ways to manage pain and get them off those. Sometimes we don't completely get them off the anti-inflammatories and painkillers, but as much as possible we'll obviously try. And then the second thing we want to do is to try and maintain their strength and build muscle. So what happens is When dogs um, have arthritis, they don't use their bodies as well as they should. And so they move in a different way. And by doing that, they use the wrong muscles and they start to waste away certain muscles. And, you know, when we look at um, the joints, and that's obviously where arthritis is, it's in the joints. There are two different types of ways in which that joint is stabilized. Um, And the one is by the ligaments and how the, the joint fits together. And the other one is by the muscles. So in arthritis, we know there is a disruption in um, the ligaments. Maybe one of the ligaments is torn a little bit or the the joint is not sitting as well as it should. And so we can't really change that besides doing any surgeries. Um, So the only thing we can change is the muscle that surrounds that joint. And if, if we can build that muscle up, we can offer that joint some support. And the more supported it is, the less pain they're in and then yeah. the less pain they're in the better they walk and then we can so we, we actually try and break that sort of pain cycle and at the same time building muscle to help um, support the joints yeah and they probably then move more more normally their gait is a more normal gait so they're not kind of twisting and putting strains on other parts of the body to try and compensate which then probably leads to pain in different areas as well I'd imagine it's kind of much like if we've got a sore knee actually it can end up in hip pain because we're changing our gait so I mean, that's great. And I guess, like you said, we're not all that different from humans. Um, You know, we use physiotherapy an awful lot and it's become so common. So why then do you think maybe, and we may not have an answer to this, but why are we maybe behind with the provision for rehabilitation services in our pet dogs and cats? Because very often it's something that maybe isn't recommended. It might not even be available, which is obviously a limit to how um, much that can be pursued by an individual. But also I do find that 
people are maybe reluctant to spend that money to go to a rehabilitation specialist, especially after spending maybe a lot of money on surgery. So why do you, yeah, why do you think there's that maybe kind of we're, we're behind the times there? Yeah, I think it's a very new field. So it isn't something that vets are very familiar with. You know, yeah. I qualified in 2001. And if I can tell you, I probably spent half a day talking about veterinary physiotherapy or rehabilitation. And it yeah. was mainly about like swimming dogs. Yeah. Um, but it's obviously so much more than that. Um, so I think that there is, we, we need to increase the awareness um, amongst vets. Yeah. And I think the younger generation of vets that are coming through are aware of it. But if, what we find now in most of the veterinary physiotherapy practices is that we're actually getting most of our clients through pet owners. So a pet owner through word of mouth will tell another pet owner. And we get some referrals, but probably not enough. I think that it's a great question. I think that it's one of these kind of things where I think when it becomes more mainstream, I think that it would be second nature, like when when a human has an operation, automatically in the hospital, the physio comes, you know, and we, we, we need to get it that way because there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing this for our pets. And I mean, we can see the amazing results that we get. And if you compare animals that have had operations and haven't had any physio afterwards compared to the ones that have, we can see how much they improve and how quick they improve. And, you know, you mentioned something about um, the compensation and injuries that they'll get. So if they, you know, when an animal has an injury somewhere, they move in a different way and this can cause injuries elsewhere. And this is really something that we want to, to limit. Um, so we don't want, because a dog has a problem with its left knee, for example, for them to shift all their weight onto the right front leg and then start causing problems there and maybe tearing a ligament or straining something there. And that causes multiple problems. And so when we actually do physio and we have on the area that's affected, we can minimize the chance of these other injuries popping up. Yeah, absolutely. And from that point of view, just, you know, kind of I mentioned costs are concern. And unfortunately, you know, I don't work in an area where insurance is a is a thing. We don't have a very heavily insured client base. So a lot of people are cost conscious, but actually physiotherapy and different rehabilitation therapy might save people money because it will reduce the risk of complications. Like you say, with arthritis, it might be able to get them off painkillers or, or just reduce the dose, which over a long period of time could actually make a huge difference in the, the, the cost of that pet's healthcare. So yeah, it improve recovery and actually may even be cheaper as well, I guess, is something to think about. So I don't have any answers either. We Thankfully, we didn't have any kind of major services near where I've been practicing, but we've got a couple of qualified qualified animal physios now and the clinic that we're building is going to have a much more rehabilitation focus we're going to have a suite and and yeah definitely going to be some staff training there so that we can offer that to our clients because we recognize that that really is an important development and service that we can be offering with that in mind like we're thinking of you know physiotherapy but what kind of other rehabilitation services might people see and which ones are the the more mainstream ones maybe so you've mentioned hydrotherapy as well but yeah what kind of things should people be thinking about there yeah so i think when we when we think about physiotherapy it's sort of like a broad term so physiotherapy is more you know using different types of modalities like we have things like lasers we have ultrasound things that we can use machines in our hands but then there are also different sort of facets within physiotherapy and one of them is treating animals in water which is hydrotherapy and then um, within hydrotherapy we have swimming as well as an underwater treadmill so those are two different ways in which we can treat them and these are actually sometimes you know people think it's the same but they're different in that the swimming is completely non-weight bearing whereas the underwater treadmill they're actually walking in water so they they've got decreased weight bearing but they're still actually walking and so we use swimming and underwater tra- treadmill for different types of conditions. Um, so swimming is great for exercising. It's great for all joints. But if we have problems like a dog, for example, is paralyzed, then we want to be teaching them to walk again. So then an underwater treadmill, if there was one available to you, would be a much better option because we want to get them to do that actual motion of walking. 
And then things like um, hip dysplasia, cruciate ruptures, we really want to be activating the muscles um, around the, the hip joint and around the knee joint, and we need weight bearing in order to do that. And so the underwater treadmill for those cases would be preferable. And um, things like elbows, shoulders, those are really good for the pool. Strengthening the back is also really good for the pool. But some of us don't have the opportunity to be able to choose whether we can have a hydrotherapy or underwater treadmill. And so either one is great. If you have the opportunity to choose, then you choose different ones. And then the other thing that we also do is therapeutic exercises. So you might have seen loads of pictures of dogs balancing on balls yep. and little sort of pods and balance boards and things like that. And, you know, one of the things that when we are looking at addressing their two things, so the pain and strengthening of them, is we want to make sure that their balance is good and try to activate all the right muscles to help support the joints. And yeah. so we use um, these balls and all these different sort of uh, equipment to help us with this. And this is sort of a long-term plan. So once we stabilize them and manage their pain, get them to a little bit of strength, then we'll start to use the exercises to help them to maintain. And a lot of these are actually given as home exercises. Okay, um, so yep. sometimes they'll come into the clinic and they'll actually do them. And other things will be given to the, the, the pet owner to do at home. Okay. So when people maybe go for for a referral, hopefully they're being referred by their vet or, or word of mouth. What, what can they expect maybe from that first appointment and what should they be looking for if they are keen to have, you know, pursue physiotherapy? What should they be looking for when it comes to choosing a, a provider who offers a good service and who's experienced and properly trained? Yeah. So I think for your first consult, you want to be going to either a veterinarian who is veterinary rehabilitation trained or a veterinary physiotherapist. So it's quite a diverse field and we have lots of people coming in from all different um, areas. And um, there are some sort of short courses that offer like massage therapy and um, that's fine. You can have someone massage your dog, but if you want like a full uh, veterinary physiotherapy assessment, it needs to be done by a qualified vet physio or a veterinarian that has done a certificate yep. in, in rehab. But when the, the dog or animal first comes to us, we'll do a full assessment. Okay. So what we really want to be doing is we want to be seeing where are the problem areas. So where is the pain? And um, where is the primary area that is the problem and where are all the compensations? So we were chatting about how they alter the way that they walk and they will have all these other areas. And often, you know, we'll get cases that will come to us and, you know, the primary area actually won't be apparent. So it'll just be that, that, that compensatory injury that we will mm. see first of all. And once we treat that, then the primary area, you know, then we suddenly see there's, there's more going on here. But we'll have a, do a full assessment. We'll have a look and see, and um, the muscle mass. So we take measurements of their muscles to see if they are balanced. We have a look at the ability for them to be able to bend and straighten their joints. Is that within the normal range? We want to see how they're moving, if they're moving symmetrically and, and balanced. And we want to see what their lameness is like. We look at their posture as they're standing and in movement. And we do a full assessment. And then once we've done that, we create a rehabilitation plan and you mentioned earlier about, you know, sometimes, you know, it's an affordability problem that people can't afford possibly or they're worried about you know, how much money that they've spent. And what I want to say is that, you know, it doesn't have to be the full everything that the, the, the rehab therapist actually recommends. And often what will happen is we will say, like, this is what we recommend. And depending on the clients and their affordability and their time, we can alter that um, into something that actually fits with them. So every animal has a tailor-made program. So there's no sort of, this is what we do for this condition. We look at that, that case, and then depending on the findings that we have, we make a tailor-made program exactly for them, which we can adjust um, depending on the availability of the clients and how often they can bring the dog in. And then the suggestions would, would normally be twice a week for the first four weeks. That's normally what we do. Yep. And then we'll reevaluate them. So then we do reevaluate, we'll do measurements again to see if there's any improvements. And we really want to see that we're improving in lameness, we're improving in pain, their ability to bend and straighten their joints. Um, so we want to see and then that there's muscle growing too. And then we'll adjust our program as it goes. So usually they have to get into some type of maintenance depending on the condition. For those post-operative cases, especially if they're young, some of them come in and then we have a sort of eight to 12 week program. And then we often don't see them again until they become a little bit older and they start to become arthritic. 
for the, the, those senior dogs that are arthritic, they normally get onto some type of maintenance program where we'll be seeing them at least once a month just to maintain them, just to check that everything is, you know, they're doing their home exercises okay and that we are maintaining that muscle because that's the biggest thing. So yep. when we get those, those, those um, animals that come in and they can't stand because they, their muscles have wasted away so much it's so difficult for us then to work with them because there's no muscle to actually do any of the exercises. Yeah. So, you know, I, what we really like is when, you know, the dog starts to show some symptoms and we can start seeing that they're struggling a little bit. And I think one of the things, especially with those senior dogs, is we often think, oh, this is just old age. And, and it isn't really. The, the dog is in pain. You know, if a dog is limping, a dog is struggling to stand up, there is a lot that we can do. And the earlier that we do it, really the better. Um, so, I mean, I've had 15-year-old uh, Labradors that have come to see me and, and there was this one called Oreo and I remember him so, so clearly. And the owner actually, I mean, amazing. He was 15 when he came to me, but he still had quite a lot of muscle, but he was really sore and he was on anti-inflammatories and painkillers. And after four months of treatment, he used to be able to jump. We had a stable door in my consult room and he used to jump over to come to see me. He was so excited to come <laughs> into me and he was 15 years of age. Um, so yeah, there, there's so much that we can do and we can extend the life of, especially these old senior dogs by so much. I mean, I've seen dogs that I, I've thought, this dog is going to be put to sleep and a week or two later we're starting to see improvements and six months later they're doing one hour walks you know so there's a lot that we can do yeah you're right old age isn't a disease and and being proactive and getting in earlier is yeah huge i mean genetics for that 15 year old labrador must have been amazing that's um, that's brilliant and it's something that you know i talk about a lot a lot and and my heart kind of sinks every time someone comes into the consult room and goes oh no i'm not interested they're just old it's just normal i don't want to do anything and and you think there's so much that we can be doing for these patients so you mentioned that we can do, you know, that you're going to be sending home clients with exercises to do after that assessment. And that's a, a very personal, individualized assessment, which I guess, and it goes, you know, that's true for most medical conditions. There's always, you know, our gold standard plan A. But I think kind of my feeling is that a big part of the vet's role and the rehabilitationist as well, it sounds like, is to to work with our client, work with our patient to 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 work within the limitations that are very often present so those options b c or d or whatever are, are, are you know just as as valid and and are certainly better than nothing but for those people who think oh well it doesn't sound too difficult just standing my dog on one of those wobble boards because you do see lots of pictures on instagram and things what could possibly go wrong if they're not you know led and guided in what they should be do their dog hasn't or their cat hasn't had an assessment what what are the kind of the pitfalls of just diying it yeah, I mean, the problem is, is that if they're not strong enough to be doing some of the exercises, then they're actually using the completely wrong muscles. Yeah. And so you're not actually getting the benefit. They can obviously hurt themselves, which is a yeah. problem. And it might be something that is actually contraindicated in the condition that the animal has. So, you know, I, even if you if you want to do exercises, what I would recommend is even just go for one consult to so get their yeah. assessment. And then actually say to the vet rehab therapist or the vet physio, I am not going to carry on for treatments. I really just want to come here for you to assess my, my dog and to give exercises. And then two months later, you can come back again. They can reassess and then give you some more exercises to do, depending yeah. on the level. And I think the thing is, is that we see all these YouTube videos and, and some of them are amazingly done. And we think, oh, and we, you know, we see dogs like standing on balls, but it's actually really difficult to do that. So, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried to stand on a ball. Um, it's not easy to do. So, the dog, and for the dogs too. And we basically go through levels. And that's why our, our rehabilitation programs are tailor-made. Because we assess them to see where they're at. And then we decide what, you know, what the next level is. But you can't just put a dog on a ball. So it has to do yeah. the very basics. So they have to do a lot of standing exercises first before we do the more advanced exercises. And the other thing is, is that, you know, if there is an injury, you know, tissues are healing at different, in different ways and do all different speeds and stuff. So we want to make sure that we're not doing an exercise that is going to slow down that healing or inhibit that healing. So 
it's really important that you get an assessment first and then do it with a vet physio. And they're very open. The vet physio will be open to working with you as long as they can assess the dog or animal on a regular basis to make sure that they're giving you the right advice. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, it could be that then maybe if you've had to travel, you could maybe work with there might be a, a vet nurse or technician in your local practice who hasn't done all of the qualifications, but maybe has seen a bit of practice and can can help, you know, if you're struggling to do those those exercises. So there's lots of different, yeah, lots of different options there. For those people who are still on the fence as kind of, you know, I'm sure what they've listened to now will have convinced them that physiotherapy can play a huge role, make a massive difference and is well worth the time and effort. But maybe what would be your parting comments for someone who's not sure if, you know, physiotherapy is something that they want to want to go down with their pet? I think we must just think about humans and I think about the results yeah. that they get. And I think sometimes, you know, we, we have this thought that everything needs to be done like in a veterinary practice. And, um, you know, like before what it would happen is the vet would do everything, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. changed now. And so there are all these other different professions and it's exactly the same for humans. And humans have great impact from the physios and other people that treat them, not just their, their doctor. Um, so I, I really recommend that you look at veterinary physiotherapists and vet rehab therapists. And I, I know the difference that we make. And I've had loads of cases that I've treated. And the quality of life for your animal can be changed. And there's so much that we can do. Absolutely. Here's hoping that one day veterinary physiotherapy and hydrotherapy becomes as well recognized and thought of as, as our human counterparts, because it certainly deserves to be. So, Dr. Meg Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today, imparting all your wisdom and experience. Uh, it's been hugely helpful. I've certainly learned a few things. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. As, as kind of a last thing, where would um, people um, go to if you'd like to kind of if they'd like to learn more about you and the work that you do and, and physiotherapy as a whole? Where would where would be the best places for them to go? Yeah, so I mean, the platform that I have now is really real. I, I educate the vet rehab therapists now. Yep. Um, so that's onlinepetout.com. But for those pet owners, I would really recommend that you go to the Canine Arthritis Management website. I don't know if you know that website. Yeah. Um, it's CAM. Um, so if you've got any dogs, senior dogs, there is loads and loads of information um, for pet owners on how to manage and dogs and loads of tips and advice there so that's what i'd recommend perfect so i'll leave those links in the show notes hopefully we're going to have hannah from cam on the podcast very soon as well um i've been harassing her i know know her quite well so hopefully she'll come on meg thank you so much for your time and yeah take care thanks alex well if that doesn't convince you that physiotherapy hydrotherapy and different rehabilitation services deserve to be a core pet health offering i really don't know what will but i would love to hear your thoughts uh, maybe send me a dm over on instagram where you can find me with the handle at our pets health and really if you did find it helpful if you think it will benefit someone you'd know i'd appreciate it if you could share this episode with them so that i can help more people help grow the podcast and ultimately help affect the lives Lives of more pets but that's it from me for today i'll be back on your airwaves next week answering a question all about lip flicking and dental problems so that's definitely one not to miss but until then i'm dr alex this is the call the vet show take care thanks for listening to call the vet for full show notes and any links mentioned in today's show head over to call the vet.org where you can also submit your question to be featured on an upcoming episode. We'll see you next time.